Now's the time to silence your phones or put them on vibrate if you haven't already done so. Thank you. Okay, so I would like to say to you good evening. And uh, my name is Sarah Abosh Jacobson. I'm the Chief Education Programs and Exhibitions Officer of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. And I am really, really pleased to welcome you all to our first annual Middleman Berman Lecture featuring Dr. Omer Bartoff. Uh, this has been a while in coming and planning and executing uh, the, the notion of this uh, annual uh, program, and so it's very, very exciting to be able to, to, to watch it come to fruition. I'd like to start this evening by extending a special welcome to our museum members. Your support helps us continue offering programs like tonight's. If you are not yet a member, I would encourage you to visit our membership table in the lobby immediately following this program. And I would also ask, why on earth are you not a member yet? So, uh, I'd also like to give a big thank you to our community partners for this evening. Anti-Defamation League Texoma, Big Brothers Big Sisters Greater Dallas, Community Homes for Adults Inc., Congregation Anshay Torah, Legacy Senior Communities, Refugee Services of Texas Incorporated, SMU Human Rights Program, Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission, World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth, and thank you all again for your support, and it is such a pleasure to be able to read longer and longer lists like this as we've, as we've uh, made our mark in the community over the years. Finally, I'd like to thank our generous supporters of the new Middleman Berman Lecture Series, Julie Mittal Berman and Dr. Joseph M. Berman. Julie and Joe, your support of the museum and this program is genuinely appreciated. And I'd like you both up to invite you both up to say just a few words about this program and series. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out tonight for the first annual Middleman Berman Lecture Series. When we thought about how to support the new Holocaust Museum, we thought, how do we make sure that the Holocaust stays relevant in our current and future world? How do we make sure that 50 years from now, the Holocaust is still an important lesson and is not a dot in the history books, or worse, deleted by revisionists? We wanted to make sure that there will always be a program that will continue to educate and inform about the Holocaust. We thought about my parents and what message they would have wanted us to pass on. I can still hear my father telling me, don't think it can't happen again, and don't think that it couldn't happen here in the United States. When a good friend suggested an educational program, we thought, of course. We will make sure that every year we sponsor a speaker or a program that will continue to educate and further the lessons of the Holocaust. To honor my parents, grandparents, and our extended family, as well as our Jewish family, all those who couldn't tell their stories, we're proud to have created this lecture series. We hope to bring relevant speakers to inspire, educate, and alert us, and most importantly, keep their lives honored. Thank you so much. So I just wanted to say uh, quickly, with the unfortunate rise of anti-Semitism, uh, both in the United States and certainly throughout the world, uh, I think it's, Im it's important that we have Dr. Bartov discuss uh, his particular topic tonight, the insidious uh, aspect of how genocide happens to a population that really, 10 minutes ago, so to speak, were friends and neighbors and uh, social friends and having dinner together, and then 10 minutes later, so to speak, uh, were finding their friends being carted off to 
concentration camps and in some camp, in some cases, uh, death camps. So I think his topic is especially relevant in today's changing society and changing uh, societal norms in politics. So um, I want to welcome Dr. Bartow for his uh, generous consideration of speaking at our inaugural lecture. And um, I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah. Thank you. Julie and Joe, thank you both very much. Tonight we are both pleased and actually very lucky to welcome Dr. Omar Bartoff, the John P. Birkeland Distinguished Professor of European History at Brown University and one of the world's leading experts on the Holocaust. Born in Israel and educated at Tel Aviv University and St. Anthony's College, Oxford, Dr. Bartoff's early research concerned the Nazi indoctrination of the Wehrmacht and the crimes it committed during World War II, covered in his books, The Eastern Front, 1941 to 45, and Hitler's Army. He then turned to the links between total war and genocide, discussed in his books, Murders in Our Midst, Mirrors of Destruction, and Germany's War and the Holocaust. His most recent book, and the inspiration for tonight's talk, is Anatomy of a Genocide, The Life and Death of a Town Called Buchach. Before I bring Dr. Bartoff up, I want to remind you that at the conclusion of the conversation, we will welcome written questions from the audience. Please use the note cards you were provided at check-in to write your questions, and our staff will come around to collect them as we begin the Q&A. Now, would you please help me welcome Dr. Omer Bartoff. Thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction. Thank you for hosting me. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, what I will talk about today is, um, as you heard, a book that I recently published. Um, it is very hard to provide the gist of this book in a brief talk. Um, but I will do my best to at least highlight some of the most, uh, what I see as the most important and relevant points in this study. It's especially hard because this is a book that I've worked on for many years. Um, I began um, researching and thinking about this book in the early 1990s, so it's been a very long time coming. Um, the book took me... Um, to about nine countries. I had to use uh, nine languages. Um, I uh, used documents from over 50 archives. Uh, and I collected personal testimonies and other types of uh, individual accounts of well over 300 people. Um, so this was a major undertaking all about one little town in Eastern Europe, which at the time of these events, as now, um, had a population of about 15,000 people. Um, when I started thinking about this book in the early 1990s, several things happened. Um, first of all, you may remember that this was the end of communism. And the end of communism was celebrated by many people, uh, as was said by one scholar, as the end of history. Meaning from now on, things would be much better than they had been before. Uh, shortly after uh, Fukuyama made that prediction, there were two genocides, one after the other. Uh, one in 1992 in Bosnia and one in 1994 in Rwanda. The genocide in Rwanda had the distinction of being the fastest genocide in history. Uh, in about 10 weeks, 800,000 people were murdered, mostly by machete and fire. Um, the people who were doing the killing, both in Bosnia and in Rwanda, uh, often knew each other. They often lived in the same communities, in the same villages, in the same towns. So these are very intimate genocides. 
But the 1990s was also a period in which the Holocaust finally became an internationally recognized event. We tend to forget that in the 1950s, 1960s, even 1970s, the Holocaust was not considered to have been a major event in the history of World War II, in 20th century history, not even in German history. It was largely uh, constrained within the limits of Jewish history. In the 1980s, this started changing, and there was more and more scholarship on the Holocaust, but only in the 1990s did it come to be an event that is seen, and has been seen, seen since, as an important uh, event in uh, modern history, uh, and has been internationally recognized as such. But there was a certain understanding of what the Holocaust was about. And that understanding, okay, uh, and that understanding was that it was largely what I myself once called uh, industrial murder. That is, there was a certain view of the Holocaust as a particular type of genocide in which the perpetrators did everything they could to distance themselves from the victims. And the, the, the perfection of that system was the creation of the extermination camp. That is, that people would be taken, say, from a neighborhood in Germany, in Berlin, say, from Grunewald. Uh, one day they would be collected, their neighbors would be looking from behind their windows and see the Jews, whom they knew, walking down in their great coats with their little suitcases to uh, the train station. They would get on the train and they would disappear. The train would go to the east, the Osten. And people heard rumors about what's happening in the East, things were not very good there, but they didn't really want to know much and they didn't have to see anything. As for the people themselves who were on the train, even as that train journey proceeded, they were gradually deprived of their humanity. They were crowded into trains, they, they um, suffered through that journey that often lasted a long time, it could last a few weeks. When they arrived at the camp, they would be very quickly uh, deprived of their clothes, often of their hair, and then rushed into a gas chamber. If they were lucky, the gas chamber would operate properly, and they might be dead within 20 minutes. Sometimes it lasted longer than that. And then once they were dead, people would take the corpses out and either uh, cremate them in crematoria, or bury them in mass graves. So the whole process was a process in which no one in particular was responsible for everything or saw everything. And the idea was that this would create a distance between the perpetrators and the victims. One uh, extermination camp commandant, uh, Franz Stangl, who had been an Austrian uh, police officer before the war, uh, and was commandant of both uh, the extermination camp of Sobibor and Treblinka, uh, meaning that he was responsible for over a million Jewish deaths, uh, described this uh, in an interview which he gave to a journalist years later when he was finally brought to justice, to Gita Sereni, in a book called Into That Darkness, and he said, he used to sit on his white horse on a hill and watch as this was happening, this process of the Jews running into the gas chambers, and he said, to me, they looked like lemmings. So this was a kind of understanding that we had of the Holocaust, and because I started thinking about this book in the 1990s, and because of these other genocides that had occurred, which were very intimate genocides, in which people killed people they knew, I asked myself, was the Holocaust also about that, or did this process succeed? Was there, in other words, an encounter between the perpetrators and the victims? Was there a recognition of the humanity of the victims before they were killed? Now, how do you answer this question? 
It's impossible to answer it for the entire event because the Holocaust was a vast event. It occurred over an entire continent. There were hundreds of thousands of people involved in staging it, in organizing it, and there were millions of people who were murdered. So what I thought I should do was to see what happened in one place and to zoom into one town and to see how did things actually occur in that town. So I chose a certain town. The town is called Butrach. Now, it is in Eastern Europe, and it had to be in Eastern Europe, because Eastern Europe was where most of the Jews lived before the Holocaust and where most of the Jews were murdered. But I knew certain things about Butrach which attracted me specifically to that town. One was that it was the birthplace of a famous author. Now, many people in the United States have never heard of him, but if you went to school in Israel, as I did, uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, I don't think it's still the case now, unfortunately, uh, you would have read uh, Shmuel Yosef Agnon, Shai Agnon. Uh, Agnon had the distinction of having received the Nobel Prize in Literature uh, in 1966. Uh, and I had the good fortune as a child of meeting him there, as a young teenager. Uh, he not only came from Buchach, much of his writing was about Buchach. Part of it was specifically about the town, and part of it was about a kind of Buchach that for him represented the entire culture, Jewish culture of Eastern Europe, particularly small town uh, Jewish Eastern Europe. And so I thought if I choose a town, I might as well choose the town that I knew something about from Agnon, but I really didn't know its history. I only knew his, his stories, which are beautiful stories. I, by the way, greatly recommend them to any of you who like reading fiction. It was also the town of several other important individuals. One of them you may have heard of, Shimon Wiesenthal, Simon Wiesenthal, uh, known later after the war as the Nazi hunter. When I went to his uh, archive, uh, which was really a two-bedroom apartment in Vienna, uh, when I went there after he passed, uh, I found in that archive a very large folder, uh, which was called Buchach. And that folder was uh, his entire correspondence with survivors whom he was asking to come and testify in trials uh, they were taking place in Germany in the 1960s, uh, of those who uh, participated in the murder of his own town and his own family. Another person who came from Buchach was Immanuel Ringenblum. Now, Ringenblum was uh, a well-known young historian who wrote about Jewish-Polish relations in the 1930s. But in World War II, he found himself in the Warsaw Ghetto. And as an historian, he decided to organize an archive of the ghetto. He did not know that the ghetto would be destroyed, that people would be sent to, uh, mostly to Treblinka and murdered there. But he wanted to have a record of what was happening there. And that archive, which was codenamed uh, Onik Shabbat or Onik Shabbos, uh, was buried underground when the ghetto started being destroyed, and two-thirds of it were discovered after the war. And so it was thanks to his efforts that we actually can reconstruct the history of what happened there. So these were individuals of some significance who all uh, grew up in Buchach, and both Wiesenthal and Ringeblum also attended the high school there, the gymnasium. But I also had a personal interest in Buchach, which was that my mother came from there. Now, my mother was actually born in a little village near Buchach on the banks of the Dniester, a beautiful little uh, location called Koshmiezhin. But when she was about a year old, they moved to Buchach. And she, lived, she was born in 1924, uh, and she lived there until 1935. In 1935, she, uh, together with her two brothers and her parents, uh, went to Palestine. And so she was not there during the Holocaust. And when I started studying what happened there, 
I could understand what would have happened had she stayed there. Uh, there were many accounts by women uh, survivors who were her age, and I could imagine how, what my mother would have experienced uh, had she been there. And, uh, very likely I would not have been here uh, to tell the story. Um, or the rest of my family, and my family was an extended family like most Jewish families at that time, uh, never came out of there. All those who stayed were murdered. Not a single person uh, survived these events. So because my mother came from there, I decided to interview her about her childhood. Now, when I interviewed her, I was 41 years old, she was 71 years old, uh, and I went to the kitchen and I turned on the tape recorder, which is what we used at the time, and uh, I said, Ima, tell me about your childhood. And she talked for 90 minutes straight. So she had been waiting for all those years for me to ask that question, and it never occurred to me having grown up in Israel and having been taught you don't ask about those things, I never asked her. Uh, but once I did, she spoke. Now what she told me were many interesting things that I will not share with you now, uh, but one important element in what she told me was the following. I understood from uh, the way she spoke about it that she had a fond childhood. She had fond memories of that period. Now, these were not only fond memories of a childhood, they, these were fond memories of a social environment. She grew up in a Yiddish-speaking home. She was sent to school, to the Polish school, because it was a public school. There was a Jewish school, a Talmud school, but it cost money, so her father sent her to the public school, uh, where she studied in Polish. And she spoke Ukrainian on the street because her girlfriends were Ukrainian. And they would go to the forest and would pick mushrooms, uh, collect berries, uh, play. Um, so from her uh, story, it occurred to me that the initial question that I asked, which was about the encounter between the victims and the perpetrators, was insufficient. It wasn't the whole issue. The issue was not only that one day the Germans came to the town and started killing the Jews, which is what happened, but that the way that killing took place had to do also with the relations between the different people living in that town. Because the town was not a strictly Jewish town. In fact, there were no such towns. And our notion of the shtetl as being a Jewish town is a Jewish notion. For the Jews, these towns were shtetls, or shtetlach. They remembered that there were Jews there. For Poles who lived there, they were Polish towns. And for Ukrainians who lived there, they were Ukrainian towns. And when, in a time of crisis, when the killing began, everybody got involved in it. So once I began understanding this, and it took me a while to sort of figure this out, I understood that I have to uh, go back in time and reconstruct what were the relations between those people before the killing began. And in fact, when actually did the killing begin? So in order to do that, I indeed went back in history, and I will give you a very brief uh, summary of that. Uh, Buchach, like uh, many other towns in that region, uh, was on the borderlands of a, a, a large state that is mostly forgotten now, uh, called the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, which straddled most of what we know now as Eastern Europe, Western Russia, and Western Ukraine. So it was a vast territory. And Buchach was on the southern borderlands of that town, a of, of that state, a fortified town, which was there to stop, along with the whole chain of other towns, to stop invasions from the east by the Tatars and the Cossacks, and to stop invasions from the south by the Ottoman Empire. But in 1772, <coughs> Poland was partitioned, was partitioned. There were three partitions, this was the first. By the end of the uh, 18th century, Poland disappears entirely as a state. All this vast state disappears as a political entity. 
In that first partition of Poland in 1772, that part of it, the southeastern part of it, is torn away from it and annexed to the Austrian Habsburg Empire. And it's given the name Galicia, or Galician, or Galicia. Uh, this, uh, this name was chosen by the Austrians basically to uh, cover up for the fact that they uh, 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 tore a piece from another country and for dynastic reasons, but the name stayed. And it's remained until today, there are still people who speak about themselves as Galicianas, mm -hmm. and even people living there now speak about that area as Galicia, or Halicina, if they say it in Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. Now, Galicia became the easternmost province of the empire, of the Austrian empire, uh, the most populous and the poorest. Uh, the majority of the population in the eastern part of Galicia were Ukrainians, they were then called Ruthenians. The second largest population were Poles. Uh, the Ukrainians were Greek Catholic, the Poles were Roman Catholic, and the third largest population were Jews. About 10% of the population there were Jews, and the Jews were Jews. These groups lived side by side, all together, going back in time even before the partition for about 400 years. Poles, Ukrainians, and Jews lived in towns side by side. They were distinguished by their religions. They were distinguished by their sense of who they are. They were distinguished by having different occupations. But they lived side by side, and they did not know any other existence but that. And so, in a sense, what we are talking about is a society that was not, as we would call it now, multi-ethnic or multicultural uh, or pluralistic, uh, but it was a society in which different groups lived side by side and knew only that reality. And for much of the time, from 1700 on, uh, after the end of uh, a pretty brutal 17th century, from 1700 on, there's very little violence in that area. Um, between 1700 and 1914, there's almost no violence in this region. Now, when do things start changing? They start changing with the rise of nationalism in that area. Nationalism comes later to Eastern Europe and begins in the last third of the 19th century. And what does nationalism do? Nationalism takes stories that people told about each other and about others and makes them into national and exclusively national stories. <coughs> Nationalism in that area is about what belongs to me and what belongs to others. Who belongs to the place and who does not. The Polish national narrative in this area, the borderlands of Poland, is that the Poles came to that area to civilize it. There were all kind of uh, primitive, barbarous people living there, and they came to bring them culture. They built estates, they developed agriculture, they built towns, uh, and they ultimately would transform that local population into a civilized population such as the Poles themselves. The Ukrainians didn't quite see it that way, they saw themselves as the indigenous population. They had lived there, and then the Poles had come, <coughs> colonized them, and served them, made them into serfs, exploited them, uh, impoverished them, and did that, according to this Ukrainian national narrative, with the help of their Jewish lackeys. Because for much of the time, these large Polish estates that were built in this area were run not by the Polish estate owners who preferred to live in Warsaw or go uh, and to cure to, to um, hot water springs in Germany. Uh, they were run for them by Jewish estate managers. And in fact, my great-grandfather was one of them. The Jews told a different story. Unlike the Poles and the Ukrainians, who by this point are saying, this place is mine, or this place is mine, they are fighting over the actual land, the Jews did not argue that they had a right on the land itself. They said, 
in fact, historically correctly, that they were invited to these areas by Polish landlords, Polish magnates, to develop towns and commerce. And that when they came, they also brought with them their own culture of the book, culture of learning. When Jewish nationalism began to develop, and it began to develop only in the late 19th century, it mostly developed the Zionism. In this area, Zionism was stronger than it was in the heartland of Poland. And Zionism took much of its own understanding from these Ukrainian and Polish nationalisms. That is, it was territorial, and it was about ethnicity. The only difference was that the territory that Zionism spoke about was not the territory in which the Jews were living. It was the territory of Palestine. And in that territory, something else began at that point that we're not going to talk about today. Now, despite these new national narratives, which were exclusionary and which included more and more antagonistic rhetoric, there was still very little violence in this area, in large part because it was still under the control of the Austrian Empire. And the Austrian Empire did not want these nationalisms to, to start fighting each other. Uh, in the political game in that area, there were parties, as you can see in this photo from 1907 in Buczaj, which were um, defined by ethnicity. There were Jewish parties, Ukrainian parties, Polish parties. But they could go in coalition with each other. There were coalitions between Ukrainian and Jewish parties in particular because the Poles had political hegemony there, were more powerful. Uh, in this photo, by the way, uh, one is identified uh, in Agnon uh, about two years before he left uh, the town in, uh, um, in, uh, in 1909. Now, all this changed in World War I. And we tend to forget the importance of World War I for everything that happened later on. Uh, we often, because World War II was so destructive, uh, we forget that much of, many of the roots of that violence can be traced back to World War I. And when we think about World War I, often we think about the Western Front. We think about uh, Erich Maria Remarque, all quiet on the Western Front, uh, trench warfare, and all that is true. But in Eastern Europe, on the Eastern Front, the war was extremely uh, destructive, extremely brutal, and included also a great deal of inter-ethnic violence to a much larger extent than in the West, partly because of the structure of those, uh, because that area had been under the rule of multi-ethnic empires, empires with many <laughs> ethnicities uh, and many religions. In the town of Buczaj, the destruction of World War I was immense. About 60% of the houses in that town were destroyed. Uh, most of the houses you see in this photo are empty. They were burned down. There's nothing inside them, and they, they were mostly destroyed after the war. But the war was not only about destruction of towns and tens of thousands of soldiers who were killed even in the vicinity of this little town, but also about inter-ethnic violence. When the Russians occupied Buchach, as they did many other towns in that area, they started carrying out a great deal of anti-Jewish violence. There were a number of pogroms in that town, and generally Russian rule in that area was particularly anti-Jewish. The result was that many of the other uh, inhabitants of the town were exposed to Russian violence against Jews under their control. It did show people that there is license to care to brutalize their own neighbors. Moreover, when the war ended, in this area, immediately another war started. In Western Europe, November 1918 was the end of the war. In Galicia, November 1918 was the end of the Austrian Empire, which immediately meant the beginning of a war between Poles and Ukrainians over this territory. That war was extremely brutal as well. I won't keep this up. Uh, but it meant that there were not only soldiers fighting each other on both sides, 
soldiers who had been in Austrian army uniforms and now changed into Polish soldiers and Ukrainian soldiers, and they've been trained to be soldiers by the Austrians. But that they also uh, attacked each other's villages and carried out extensive massacres. Additionally, there were also <coughs> several major cases of pogroms, uh, particularly by Polish troops, uh, during that war. Now, when all this violence ends, and we're talking about six years of extensive violence in this area, Poland is recreated. The Poland that disappeared at the end of the 18th century. But this Poland sees itself as a nation state. It is the state of the Poles. The problem is that only 60% of the population is Polish. Ethnically Polish, which in that case meant also Roman Catholic. 20% of the population living mostly in uh, the eastern parts of Poland, in Galicia, are Ukrainian. Greek Catholic Ukrainians. And 10% are Jews. And the largest concentration of Jews is also in that area. Now, for Ukrainian nationalists who had fought against Poles and had believed that they would be able to create for themselves an independent state, to be under Polish rule uh, means that they have lost their national cause. And they try again and again to revive Ukrainian nationalism with the result that they are increasingly suppressed by the Polish authorities. The Poles carry out various pacification campaigns which very brutally try to suppress any sign of Ukrainian nationalism. The result of that is, not surprisingly, the creation of the Ukrainian underground. That underground, uh, in 1929, the, the most important uh, uh, group is called the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, or OUN. That organization is a terrorist organization. It is associated with other fascist organizations throughout Eastern Europe. And once Hitler comes to power in Nazi Germany in 1933, it is also supported by Nazi Germany. Its goal is to create a Pole-free and Jew-free Ukraine. And it's biding its time. It cannot fight against the Polish authorities. Uh, it tries with terrorist acts, but it can't do more than that. It's waiting for the moment that it could come into its own. Now, for the Jewish population, um, and you can read a beautiful novel by Agnon uh, on this period, uh, called A Guest for a Night. It did come out in uh, English as well, uh, translation. For the Jewish population, this is a very um, uh, troubled period. Uh, first of all, in World War I, the Jewish po population was decimated. Many Jews fled, thousands fled to the west, to Vienna, to Prague. Others were deported by the Russians to the east. Uh, and there is extensive destruction. So the community never really revives. Uh, secondly, there is growing anti-Semitism, both by Ukrainian nationalists and increasingly by the Polish state. So while the Poles and the Ukrainians are fighting each other, there's one thing that they agree on, which is that in the future nation-state, they don't want to have any Jews. Uh, the Polish state becomes increasingly anti-Semitic, especially after 1935, when the Polish ruler Piłsudski, who was seen by the Jews as their friend, dies, and the extreme right wing in, in, in Poland becomes increasingly influential. Um, one result of it is that the most powerful political party among the Jews by the 1930s are the Zionists. Uh, that is, the Jews respond to this kind of nationalism with their own uh, national organization. But uh, apart from small groups of young Jews, such as those in this picture who belong to Ashomer Tzair, the socialist um, uh, Zionist um, youth group, uh, most Jews stay there. And by the 1930s, they cannot leave. It becomes increasingly difficult to leave the, this area. You may remember, this is the period of the Great Depression. Uh, there's unemployment everywhere. Nobody wants uh, immigrants. Nobody wants refugees. And in 1936, there is an uprising uh, by the Arab population of Palestine uh, against Jewish settlement in Palestine, as a result of which the British Mandate authorities uh, 
um, issue restrictions on Jewish immigration to Palestine. So Jews are trapped in Buchach. And there are many interesting letters where they write about this sense of being trapped, of not being able to leave a place where they're not wanted. Uh, but of course, it's not only in Buchach, it's in many, many other places. Now, we usually think of World War II as beginning in 1939, which is, of course, true. But in this area, uh, the outbreak of World War II uh, has a different aspect to it. You may know that the, uh, the reason for Hitler uh, going to war in 1939 was that he managed to have an agreement with Stalin. And the agreement was to divide Eastern Europe between them. And as a result of that, uh, Germany attacks Poland on the 1st of September 1939, and the Red Army marches into eastern Poland on the 17th of September 1939, and annexes this area, including Galicia. The Soviets rule there between 1939 and 1941. And what they do is what they do best. First of all, they take an economy that was very weak, and they destroy it entirely. They nationalize the economy, and within a short period of time, there are, there are long bread lines everywhere in Buchach and in many other towns. So um, the, the attempt to nationalize the economy in that area is an abject failure. Secondly, they start targeting various groups that they see as either their political or their social enemies. They begin by deporting large numbers of Poles, um, members of Polish officer families, members of the aristocracy, uh, members of uh, the political elite. Then they start deporting Jews. They deport Jews because they see them as social enemies. If they have a factory, they have a mill, they have a shoe store, they are considered to be capitalists and they are often deported or they deport them for political activities, particularly as Zionists. And toward the end of Soviet rule there, they start targeting the Ukrainian population. Now the Ukrainians welcomed the uh, Soviets when they came because they saw them as liberating them from Polish rule, and they believed that now they, they would unite with the rest of Ukraine, which was under Soviet rule already since the revolution. Uh, but by uh, the second year of Soviet rule, they're not so in a mood of the Soviets any longer, and they begin organizing against them. And so, in uh, spring of 1941, the Soviets arrest thousands of Ukrainian political activists and incarcerate them in local jails. And that is when the Germans attack. The Germans attack, attack on the 22nd of June, 1941, and by early July, they are inside Galicia. The result of this is a mass wave of violence. Now, the violence begins, first of all, with the Soviet secret police, the NKVD, uh, executing up to 10,000 political prisoners in those jails, mostly Ukrainians. There were Poles and Jews there, too, but the majority were Ukrainians. They execute them and they leave because the Wehrmacht, the German armed forces, are advancing. Even before the Germans arrive, the local population in these towns, led by Ukrainian nationalists, begins uh, targeting their own Jewish neighbors and killing them. The argument is that they uh, had collaborated with the Soviets in killing Ukrainian patriots. Now, there, there is no evidence that this is the case, but the argument of there having been what was called the Judo Comuna or, or Judeo Bolshevism, that Soviets, communists, and Jews are synonymous, spreads, and there is widespread violence in these towns, which then continues as the Germans arrive. So it starts even before they're there, and then it continues during the early weeks of German rule. The Germans, however, are not really interested in this kind of chaotic violence. They have a different plan. Uh, when the Soviets uh, retreat, the Ukrainians organize militias. 
armed militias, sort of like little armies, which they are hoping would enable them now to create an independent Ukraine. They also celebrate uh, the arrival of the Germans. Uh, there are many such cases, as you see here, of uh, marching in traditional uh, Ukrainian garb in front of uh, the German conquerors. And the Germans also eventually make use of this population for their own purposes in that they uh, raised in 1943 an entire Waffen-SS division called uh, SS Galician, uh, Galicia, uh, of about 18,000 men to fight the uh, returning Soviets as the Germans are running out of manpower. But what the Germans are most interested in in this area is to murder the Jewish population. That's the main goal. What they do in this area is not what we usually think of. That is, they don't... Um, uh, there is very little effect of the Einsatzgruppen, of the early uh, killing squads uh, of the SS. Instead, they establish outposts of the security police throughout Galicia. Uh, these are all under the command of the local SS commander in Lemberg or, or Vuv, Vuv. In the town next to Buchaj, called Chortkov, now Chortkiv, uh, there is one such outpost, a security police outpost. It is made of about 20 men. Uh, most of them are German, but not all of them. Some are ethnic German from Poland, from Lithuania, from Czechoslovakia. These 20 men, when they're not engaged in killing Jews, are having a very good time in that area. Um, nobody is shooting at them. They have, as you can see, they bring their wives there, or their girlfriends, or mistresses. Um, they have uh, uh, unlimited access to food, unlimited access to alcohol, unlimited access to tobacco. There's a tobacco factory nearby. And they have total power over life and death. They can do whatever they like. Nobody is watching them. And nobody can resist them. <coughs> and because of that, they bring their families there. They bring their children. The wives, some of them, bring their parents. In the period between uh, late summer, early fall of 1942 and early summer 1943, these 20 men kill an estimated 60,000 Jews in this region. Now, obviously, 20 men alone cannot carry out such mass killing. In order to facilitate this operation, they use those militias that were originally created by the Ukrainians to have their own army and transform them into auxiliary police forces. So in this town of Chotkov near Buchach, about 20 miles from Buchach, apart from 20 German security uh, police uh, officials, there are also over 300 Ukrainian auxiliary policemen. They also create police forces in each town. Each town has uh, gendarmes, German uniformed policemen, usually older men who also have families at home, children at home, uh, Ukrainian police forces, and Jewish police forces. Each town, including Buchach, is ordered to have a Jewish council, a Judenrat, and the Judenrat is ordered to establish an Ordnungsdienst, an order police. Uh, in Buchach, there is a police of about 30 men, Jewish police of about 30 men. It is with this entire apparatus that then the Germans can raid these towns every once in a while, uh, round up as many people as they can find, and kill them. In Buchach itself, about 10,000 Jews are murdered. Now, Buchach had, in 1939, a population of about 8,000 Jews. 
So more people are killed there than had lived there before the war because they're brought also from nearby towns and villages. Initially, uh, the killing is by collecting, rounding up as many people as they can find and taking them to the train station. During those roundups, or aktionen, or aktie, as they're called, uh, hundreds of people are shot on the street even before they reach the train station. People who are too sick to walk, people trying to run away. So there's a great deal of violence on the streets. But the majority of the people are brought to the train station, loaded into trains, and taken to the extermination camp of Bezhet, the designated extermination camp for Galicia. But Bezhet is closed in December 1942 by which time about half of the Jewish population of Galicia had been gassed there. Uh, slightly less than that of the, a, a lower percentage of the population of Bucha specifically. From that point on, the killing takes place in situ, in the town itself. In the case of Bucha, about 7,000 people, 7,000 Jews are murdered inside near the town. If you look at this aerial photograph, you will see is there a, uh, here it is, yeah. So, you will see uh, this is where most of the population lives. A few here. This is the river that goes around the town. Uh, this is the Jewish cemetery. And this is the Federal Hill. Uh, most of the killing occurs here. And in later, in spring and early summer 1943, here, if you stand in the middle of town, you can see both sides and hear the shooting. If you're standing on one side, you can see the other. So they're all very close to each other. Everything is very intimate. Moreover, as I said, the killing begins only in late summer, and in the case of Buchach, only in October 1942. The Germans arrive in August 1941. So between August 1941 and October 1942, they get to know the people living there. The Jews come in and out of German homes. They work as their babysitters, as their cooks, as their doctors, as their dentists, as their tailors, as their cleaners, as their drivers. They go in and out of German homes. They get to know them by name. To the extent that in one of the killings, as an example, one of the Jews calls at the, at the SS man who is about to kill him. He says, but I was your barber before being shot down. So the killing is after people had gotten to know each other. And obviously, the other participants, the Ukrainian policemen, are in most cases people who had lived there before the war. So they know precisely who the victims are. Now, most of the killing of the Jews ends uh, by uh, June 1943, at which time Galicia as a whole is declared Judenrein, clean of Jews. In fact, there are still thousands of Jews living uh, in the area, either in hiding or in labor camps. There are still agricultural labor camps in the area. But the vast majority have been killed. It is at this point that the fighting between Ukrainians and Poles resumes. Those Ukrainians who had served in, Pol in German uh, police units begin deserting these units and joining either the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, their own, or its militarized arm, the Ukrainian insurgent army, known as UPA. That insurgent army has a goal of cleansing the area of the Polish population. They begin in a nearby province of Volinia, northeast of Galicia, and then in early 1944, they come down to Galicia, and there is vast amount of violence occurring in that area. The Poles uh, um, do not 
not take this line down, but respond. The Polish Home Army is there, and therefore there is actually uh, a war going on between Ukrainians and Poles, with the Poles paying a much higher price, and large numbers of Poles being helped by the Germans to escape this area into the heartland of Poland. When the Soviets returned to this area in summer of 1944, uh, the insurgency by the Ukrainians continues. It is an insurgency against the Soviets. The Jews see the Red Army as their liberator, those Jews who are still alive. The Ukrainians see it as an occupier. And therefore they continue fighting the Red Army in a very bitter struggle, at the end of, of which uh, the Soviets have deported large numbers of Ukrainians, not only fighters, but also their families, sometimes entire villages, into Central Asia or to Gulags. And the, the Soviet authorities reach an agreement with Poland on population exchange and empty this area entirely of Poles. So that by late 1947, this area becomes what Ukrainian nationalists had always wanted it to be. It's purely Ukrainian. There are no Jews there, and there are no Poles there. Now, Ukrainians until today, certainly in Western Ukraine, as it is called now, remember this period of uh, uh, Soviet suppression, remember the camps to which they were deported or exiled for many years in Central Asia. Uh, what they don't remember are people like this individual, uh, Volodymyr Kaznovsky, who was uh, an attorney before the war and then became chief of the Ukrainian police in Buchach and had a great deal of blood on his hands and was finally caught by the Soviets and sent to a gulag. Now, Buchach was actually liberated twice. In March 1944, uh, advanced guard Soviet un uh, units reached Buchach, uh, and about 800 Jews came out of hiding, which is a high number for this area. And there are various questions, I can talk about it later, why there were relatively uh, large numbers of Jews who were still alive at that point. But two weeks later, the Red Army makes a tactical retreat. And as a result of the tactical retreat, the Jews who came out of hiding, who are too weak and ill to escape, uh, once the Germans return, are mostly murdered. So that when the Red Army returns to Buchach in July 1944, the survivors are about as many as the people you see in this photo. About 60 people left. This is of a community of about 8,000 before the war. The monument that they put up on the Federal Hill, on the site of the major killing in Buchach, was shortly thereafter removed, probably by the Soviets, who did not like Jewish-specific monuments. They wanted to uh, remember innocent Soviet uh, citizens who were killed by the fascists, not uh, the Holocaust per se. There is one monument that was lying on the floor, broken on the floor of the forest for many decades and was more recently put up. Uh, it's about this big, it's a, it's a very small stone, um, but it's almost impossible to find in the forest. You, you need a guide to find this monument uh, on the Federal Hill. On the other hand, there's a very large monument on the Federal Hill that can be seen from the distance, but that is a monument to the martyrs of Ukrainian liberation uh, for the Oun and Upa. There's now another monument in Buchach, which is a hilly city, so it has hills overlooking the town, and that's a monument to Stepan Bandera, who was the leader of the more radical faction of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists and is now glorified in Western Ukraine. If you stand on the Jewish cemetery, uh, if you look at the hill behind it, that's the hill, the Federal Hill. These are the two main sites of the killing with the town in between the two. Uh, the Jewish cemetery, which is a site of mass graves as well, was for many years abandoned, uh, used as a garbage dump. Uh, only about a year ago, uh, with some funds, outside funds obviously, 
the cemetery was surrounded by a wall. Uh, so now it is for the first time since World War II uh, protected. Uh, one monument that was put up there also only a few years ago has since been broken and it's very hard to approach because uh, in the summer it's surrounded by thorns. The major Jewish edifice in Butaj, the largest, was the Goise Shiv, the great synagogue. Uh, it was a synagogue built as a fortress synagogue, uh, which was the tradition in the area. It was built in the 18th century. And although it was damaged heavily in World War II, it was still standing there when the Soviets arrived. But there were no Jews there, and the Soviets didn't see any reason to keep it. And so they brought in a demolition team, and that demolition team spent uh, about five years destroying the synagogue and replacing it with this elegant uh, kino theater uh, cinema. So the one edifice that was left in Buchach after that was Bet Midrash, the study house, which Agnon writes about in his stories, remembering how he used to pray there as a child. It stood there until 2001, but in 2001 the mayor decided that it should be replaced by a shopping mall and destroyed it. Uh, so if you come now to Buchach, I was there last in 2016, uh, the remnants of the medieval Polish castle are still there, the Zamek. On top of it, there's a flag. The flag um, represents now the revival of Ukrainian nationalism, not least because of the war, ongoing war in eastern Ukraine that has cost up to 15,000 Ukrainian lives by now. The flag is the flag of UPA. It's the flag of the Ukrainian insurgent army which hasn't existed for decades, but represents Ukrainian pride and the suppression of all the memories of what it had also carried out in uh, participating in the murder of the Jews and the ethnic cleansing of the Poles. So with this, I want to give you just a few uh, concluding <coughs> points of why I think this entire journey uh, was worth the time and the effort. The first thing I would say is that, as you remember, my first question to myself was about the, the encounter between the perpetrators and the victims. And this image that we had of uh, being uh, industrial killing and a complete separation between the killers and the killed. Well, if you look at local genocides, such as what happened in Buchac, and that happened in hundreds of towns throughout Eastern Europe, from the Baltic to the Balkans, uh, all multi-ethnic towns. If you look at these local genocides, you realize that nothing was impersonal. These were intimate killings. The people knew each other by name. The killers and the victims uh, were familiar to each other. There was nothing secret about it. In German historiography, there were many debates as to what did the German population know about the extermination camps. There were secret, there were rumors, the soldiers coming back from the front report on that. Here, there is no need for any question. Everyone saw, everyone was there. Much of the killing, most of the killing, in the case of Butchach, happened right there. So it was public, not secret. Secondly, and very importantly, we have come to speak of uh, three categories in cases of genocide, of perpetrators, victims, and bystanders. But if you think about such uh, a case of local killing, and as I say again, in hundreds of places, indeed half of the victims of the Holocaust did not die in extermination camps. They died in such killings. In these cases, the term bystander loses any meaning. Because what does it mean that you are a bystander in a town of 15,000 people when half of the population is killed there under your windows? What does it actually mean to be a bystander? Who is standing by? If you live in an apartment house, you live on the first floor, and there's a Jewish family on the fourth floor, and, and you know them, they are your friends, your children have studied together. They sat in your kitchen. But one day, the police come, they take them out, and they shoot them on the street. 
So you feel sorry for them because they were your friends. But now there's an apartment. And it's a better apartment than yours. It gets better air, and the, the nice pots and, pots and pans there. Uh, and if you don't move in there, somebody else will. Maybe the neighbors from the third floor. So you move in, and once you move in, you become part of the process. And the process of genocide, which we often don't think about, is that much of it is about property. And many people who are so-called bystanders profit from genocide. Genocide is a profitable undertaking. It's not only about killing people. Much of Eastern Europe today lives in property that was once belonged to other people who happened to have been either murdered or uh, ethnically cleansed. <coughs> Thirdly, what struck me, because much of this research was based on personal accounts and how people talk about what happened to them, what struck me is that while we can say that evil, in the sense of the people doing the killing, we can identify some kind of absolute <coughs> evil. There are people among these perpetrators who have nothing redeeming about them, no redeeming feature whatsoever. But when we talk about goodness, uh, that's a much more ambiguous term. We have to remember that all the people who survived in such cases as Buchach and all the hundreds places like it. The Jews who survived could not have survived without somebody helping them. You cannot identify a case that somebody survived without help. Help had to come from Christians, and it had to come from, in this case, from Poles and Ukrainians. And in other places it would have been Belarusians or Latvians or Lithuanians or Romanians or Hungarians, depending on the but you could not survive without some help. And usually more than one person had to help. Somebody had to give you bread, somebody had to give you milk, somebody had to give you shelter in winter. So that is the one side of it. And it was very dangerous to help. And you can imagine if you have a family, you have small children at home, somebody knocks on the door and says, shelter me and my baby. And you know that behind them there are people with guns. Would you let them in? We, we don't know if we would or we wouldn't. But on the other hand, most of the people who were denounced were denounced by the people who were giving them shelter. And that too is initially difficult to grasp. Because if you gave people shelter, why did you give them shelter? Well, you may have given them shelter because they gave you money. Because they promised you property. You may have done it simply because you took pity on them. But once you have them, you have to buy them food. How do you buy them food if you're a poor peasant living in a forest? So they give you money, even if you didn't shelter, shelter them for that purpose. And then they run out of money. So how do you give them food? So you may say, you have to leave. But if you let them leave, then your neighbors may denounce you. Your neighbors may denounce you anyway because they suspect that you're sheltering someone, because they see that you're buying more food than you need, and then they think, well, you're sheltering Jews, you're making money, you're profiting from that. They are jealous. They may denounce you. So it's better that you let them out or that you denounce them. Other people might think, well, they're giving you shelter, but ye, the people they're sheltering have something that they want. And they want it now. They don't want to wait. They have a good fur coat. They have nice boots. So you ask them. So all of this means that while there were people who were entirely altruistic, most of the people who were saving were also people who were engaged in denouncing. And that it's very difficult to identify what we would like to do. Absolute evil and absolute good. On the ground, that rarely happens, certainly the second. And I'll give you an example of the opposite, which to me was very important. You may have heard that I started my research writing on the crimes of the German army. Um, 
So, so I have a certain understanding of what the German army did in Soviet Russia in World War II. Uh, and um, it carried out mass crimes not only against Jews, in fact primarily not against Jews, but against other Soviet citizens. Uh, somebody had to kill between 20 and 30 million Soviet citizens, and it was the German military uh, that was engaged in that. Um, but even in the case of Butrach, there is another example. Um, in the months between March and July 1944, between the first liberation of Butrach and the second liberation of Butrach, this area descends into total chaos. The security police, the Gestapo, all those people who liked being there because it was not dangerous, now it's dangerous, and they leave. They're not there anymore. Uh, there's only the German military and the advancing Red Army. Most of the German military is arriving as it is retreating from the Red Army. And there is a great deal of violence in the forest. There are bandits, there are soldiers who deserted their units, there are peasants who are hungry, uh, and much of that violence is directed against Jews who are still hiding. And there are numerous massacres of Jews in hiding or in labor camps by the local population. And at some point, a rumor goes around the forest that there is a German officer in a town near Buchach called Wuster, now it's called Tovce, um, who has declared that he will protect the Jews from the local population. And Jews start streaming to that town. The rumor passes through the forest, and people start trying to make their way to that town. And about 600 Jews end up in that town. And this officer, whose name we don't know, and about whom we know only from Jewish accounts, says, I will protect you until the Red Army comes. And he stays there until the morning of the day in which the Red Army returns. Now, after he leaves and the Red Army comes in, the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, comes and bombs the town. And about 200 of those 600 are killed in that bombing. But the rest of them survive, and because he saved them, we have their accounts about him telling us that there was this one man who may well have had a lot of blood on his hands earlier, or even after, but at that point he made a choice. And that to me was another important understanding from this book, that at any given point, people had a choice. The choices were obviously limited. You couldn't change the course of history. But you could either pull the trigger or not. You could denounce or not. You could give a piece of bread and milk or not. People made choices all the time. And two last points that, is that I want to make uh, before I let you go. Um, I would say that when we look at these local cases, we understand the terms that we like using, such as liberation, uh, heroism, collaboration, mean different things to different people at different times, within a short period of time. Um, people who were victims at one point could become perpetrators at, at another. Uh, Poles who were being uh, persecuted and killed by Ukrainians, once the Red Army returns, uh, mobilize into destruction battalions and participate in the destruction of Ukrainian villages identified as insurgent <coughs> villages. There is a cycle of violence. There is a, a story that occurred to me that is, illustrates this uh, uh, particularly well. When the Red Army arrives in this area, Jews who are in hiding uh, are afraid of people in uniform with guns. And so Soviet officers, there were many officers in frontline units who were Jewish, combat officers. Uh, but they're Soviet Jews, they, um, they, they have largely assimilated, they know only a few words in Yiddish. But they use these words in Yiddish, they call out to people, we are the Red Army, we have come to liberate you. For the Jews, this is a miracle. They suddenly see men in uniform who have come to save them, to protect them. For Ukrainians, this proves what they had always said. 
The, the Red Army, the Jews, they're all Judeo-Bolsheviks, and they have now come to occupy them. The same event is seen completely differently and is remembered until today completely differently. So when we think about the, the events of the Holocaust from this perspective, and as I say, this is about 50% of what the Holocaust was about, if not more, then we realize how much of it looks like so many other genocides. That what happened in Rwanda, what happened in Bosnia, where neighbors were killing neighbors, where the genocide was an intimate case, is very similar to what happened in such towns as Puchac. There is a major difference. The major difference is that the Nazis created extermination camps, deported people from, from uh, uh, far away, uh, and such camps are unique. There were never such factories of death before the Holocaust or after. But for much of the Jews and for much of the local population around them, the events of the Holocaust were very similar in nature to this kind of intimate killing that we've seen over and over again in many other genocides. So finally, I'll say this. <coughs> Only in the last few years I started thinking about it as I was completing this book and as uh, we see uh, um, politics in our world sort of taking a turn, uh, somehow uh, forgetting, because people don't study history, uh, forgetting what happened in the past. And it occurred to me that we in our own neighborhoods uh, if you look at what happened in Buchach, you may want to realize that this, what we rely on, this sense that of order, of law, of social relations, of trusting our neighbors, uh, is really existing on a very thin crust. And that, that crust can crumble very easily. And once it does, everything will change and can change very quickly. You think if you one day wake up at 2 a.m. and you hear some noise on the street and you think maybe there's a burglary going on and you pick up the phone and you call the police and the police come and arrest you. And you say, but it was about the noise outside. And you suddenly realize that the whole order that you relied on, there is still law. But now you are not on the right side of the law. There is still police enforcement, law enforcement. But now it's turned against you. And once that happens, your neighbor can easily walk into your home with an axe and take your TV away, take your children away, destroy your life. So thank you. I'm happy to, happy to take questions. <laughs> So uh, what I would say is that uh, we've gone, I think, a little bit over time. So uh, we're going to wrap up the public part of this program. I would like to thank again uh, Dr. Joe and Julie uh, Mittal Berman. And I would like to thank Dr. Bartoff as well. And I would ask maybe if you'll stay at least for a few minutes afterward if people want to come up and ask you questions. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.
Next time.